two. Double going. This film tells the story of the English art of bell ringing, which has been practiced and developed for over 300 years. Three to one. Today, bell ringers perform for Sunday services, weddings and other special occasions. They also ring quite often just for fun and to improve their performance. They include young and old, male and female, who all share the enthusiasm for this very special branch of music. We do not know when the bell was invented. Some of the earliest records are from Chinese dynasties which had bells dating back 3,600 years. Many civilizations used bells in religious rites even before the development of written language. In England, Handbells became popular in the age of saints in the 5th and 6th centuries. Missionaries who travelled the country used them to summon people together, thereby introducing handbells into the farthest parts of the British Isles. There are a surprising number of these very early handbells that survive. There's one in the National Museum in Ireland, which is St. Patrick's Bell, so it dates from the 5th century. And from this period, there's supposed to be at least 50 bells surviving from 5th, 6th, 7th centuries, and a number of bells in of these sort of handbells in Wales as well. We assume that as the church became more settled with churches, then there was felt to be a need for some means of summoning local people to worship, and so with the introduction of larger bells. Certainly in the 10th century, St Dunstan of Canterbury was a bell founder, and in 977 he drew up rules for actually ringing bells for the greater religious houses, telling them what to ring and when to ring, so implying that bells were quite common at that time. Monks were the first bell founders in England, but the art eventually extended to secular craftsmen who travelled the country setting up foundries in fields close to churches, sometimes even in the churches themselves. To ring the bells, each bell was secured to its wooden headstock by iron straps through the cannons nailed to the headstock. The whole headstock would have been turned with probably an arm sticking out from the side. So you get a sort of a headstock with an arm sticking out and you just simply literally just, just pull on. In fact, little bells in, um, you know, school bells and that sort of thing are still rung that way. So it's, it's a very, very simple thing. And the bell only swings a matter of, I don't know, 30 degrees or something of that sort. The ringing of a bell had two main religious purposes, to announce death and to call people to worship. Later on, they also served the purpose of telling the time too. As years passed, it became customary for the larger churches and cathedrals to have several bells, but up until the 15th century, only one bell was rung at a time, each of which had a particular purpose. The Ave bell was rung in the morning to call you from your bed and to your prayers. The sermon bell indicated that a sermon was about to begin, and the Sanctus bell was tolled during the sermon, when the choir sang Sanctus, Sanctus, Sanctus. Certainly in medieval times the bell ringers were 
really servants of the church. The situation changed in the 16th century because we had the Reformation at that time. So the Catholic Church, because of Henry VIII's activities, uh, was no longer the National Church, became the Church of England, and attitudes changed. These offices within the great churches would have done away with. Um, and so that uh, it's at that point that you get the developments, start of the developments lead to the English art of change ringing. And in the 16th century, it seems to be in London, East Anglia, there was a sporting element came in that maybe the youths of the parish, looking for something else to do, um, found it was fun to ring the bells and swing the bells. It's a good activity, a good exercise. And really it's almost divorced from the services of the church because it really was a sporting exercise. It's probably fairly certain that the wheels were gradually extended so that you could swing a bit further because the thing I described with the bell just going like that, um, that was a bit limited. And you're limited to the pendulum effect. The bell will swing at its speed and that's as far as you can go. So they then moved on to quarter wheels um, a half wheel, and by the time they got to a half full wheel, it then became possible for the bell to turn completely upside down. First one side and then the other. Then, then you've got control over the speed, where any of the earlier systems, um, there is no control. You know, rather like on the continent, you hear bells on Sunday morning in Paris or somewhere. Um, it's just simply a clang, dong, dong, because they can only swing the bells at the speed they will swing. The English style of hanging of the bells is a unique one. Apart from mainly English-speaking territories, there is nowhere else in the world where bells are hung this way. The bell is fitted to a headstock of wood or iron. At each end of the headstock, there are gudgeons on which the bell can swing. Attached to the headstock at one end is a large grooved wheel. At the other end is a long wooden bar called the stay which comes into use once the bell is turned upside down as we shall see later. The rope is tied to the wheel, goes round the rim of it, then through pulleys down into the ringing chamber below. To raise the bell to its upside down position the ringer has to swing the bell higher and higher until the bell is turning full circle. This is known as raising the bell or ringing up. In most cases, more than one bell is rung up at a time. This is known as ringing up in peel. Once the bell is up, the purpose of the stay becomes obvious. It allows the ringer to stand the bell, in other words, to leave it in its upright position. There are two strokes to ringing, the hand stroke when the ringer pulls on the so-called sally and the back stroke when he pulls on the end of the rope known as the tail end.
the stay is the piece of vertical wood attached to the headstock, which, when the bell is upside down, it rests against what's called the slider, for obvious reasons, because it slides backwards and forwards, and the bell comes upside down and rests gently against the slider. The stay is made out of uh, ash, um, straight grained ash. Um, the point about this is that if you do over pull it, then the stay breaks and nothing else breaks. If you had you know, solid oak or you know, a, a, a steel stay or something of this sort, um, there's a possible possibility that you might damage the headstock, you might damage the, the bearings, and that is seriously expensive. It happens in all sorts of circumstances. You'll feel that the rope is being dragged out of your hands. Now, if you're a reasonably experienced ringer, you'll realise what's happened and let go. Um, if you're only just learning, you might panic and not let go, and then other, it's up to other people you know, to ensure you don't hit the ceiling. I mean, there's all sorts of stories about, about people doing these things. Um, to say exactly what you do, it, it does depend to some extent whether you break it in hand stroke or back stroke, where the rope is, because if it's a back stroke, it's easy to just let them go of the rope. If it's a hand stroke, you've got the possibility of the, the rest of the rope. Um, you've got the tail end in your hand, you've got the sully there, and you've got a loop of rope which is going to go flowing up to the ceiling. Um, so you've, you've really got to let go and jump back out of the way. Bells are hung usually so that they're swinging opposite to each other. This means that the amount of force put on the tower is kept to a minimum. Tower oscillation is basically where a tower moves a certain amount with the movement of the bells. Um, when a bell, a single bell is ringing, the force exerted um, backwards and forwards is roughly two times the weight of the bell. So if you've got a bell weighing 10 hundred weight, you've got a hundred, a ton of force throwing first one way and then the other and the force going downwards is about four times that so you'd have something like two tons forcing downwards there's always a little bit of movement um, sometimes you can detect it um, brick towers are particularly notable because the the cement contracts and expands between the bricks so if you go to a tall red brick tower you will feel quite a fair bit of movement In every tower, the bells are numbered. The one with the highest note being number one is also called the treble bell. The one with the lowest note is called the tenor. At the moment, when someone learns to become a bell ringer, one of the initial stages is what we call call changes, where a single pair of bells is changed over, actually on instruction. The earliest form of change ringing was like that, that just a single pair of bells changing order, bells that are ringing adjacent, and that's what we call single change peals. The number one bell changes place with the bell behind him on each pull of the rope. It first changes with the number two, then with the number three, then the number four, and so on until it's the last bell in the line. At this point, the number two bell starts the same work until it is at the back, then the number three, four, and so on. And that's the very basis of change ringing. Actually, they're quite hard to ring. And 
Um, so I guess, my guess is that this is why there was quite a long development period. The first book on change ring that was published was one called Tintin Loja, which was published in 1668. And it was written by Richard Duckworth, an Oxford man, although the name on the title page was Fabian Stedman. Stedman was in effect the publisher because he saw it through the press. It's a very good and very well written exposition of the art at that time, which was in its early stages. But because of the rapid developments in London, in East Anglia, Stedman himself produced a book called Campanologia in 1677, only nine years later. That wasn't as well written, but it showed the technical improvements in change ringing in only nine years. It also gives a clue as to where the centres of change ringing were because, for instance, included in the book of Campanologia there were peals from Oxford and other places, Cambridge for instance, which are clearly centres of change ringing. Between the publication of Tintologia in 1668 and the publication of Campanologia in 1677, the sort of modern methods that we ring now were being developed and were developed to a large extent where more than a single pair of bells change at any one time, change systematically. And whereas Campanologia mentions a few of the single change peels which dominate Tintinologia, there are dozens, literally dozens of the more the newer style of method in Campanologia, a much more greater variety. And ringers like variety, they like different methods to ring. If you're doing three, four up, if you're doing three, four going up to the back, going down, four, going straight, doing next time. No, no, you do it next time. Yeah, 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 Look to. I can say it, but can I do it? Look to. Travel's going. Travel's gone. If you've got two bells, you can only ring them two ways ding dong or dong ding. If you've got three bells, you've got six different ways of doing it. If you had four bells, or four playing cards, ace, two, three, four, you could write them out, put them out there in 24 different ways. And five is 120, six is 720, seven bells, 5,000 different ways of doing it. Now then, bell ringing methods are ways of getting the different rows. When you're ringing, every row has to be different. It must be. Otherwise, it's false, as we call it. Today, the basis of method ringing is the so-called plain hunting course. Plain hunting is basically an improvement on single changes. The difference being that all the bells move around at once. Rounds, as we know, is one, two, three, four, five, six. To get the first line of changes, the bells are changed over in pairs, giving the order of two, one, 4, 3, 6, 5. If this action will be repeated in the next line, we will get back to rounds, which we do not want. However, if we change the two middle pairs, we get a new row, 2, 4, 1, 6, 3, 5. Continuing this pattern eventually brings us back to rounds, producing 12 changes, all different. If we have a look at what happened to each bell, the number one for instance, we see that it has moved up one place at a time, as it did in plane changes. But while it has been doing this, all the other bells have been moving too. You have to learn where to go in the row. And it's done by drawing a line through your bell, and like a graph. You have to learn this line. When you're in, you concentrate on this graph in your mind. You're not allowed visual aids to memory. You're not allowed to have a music stand with it all written in front. Definitely not.
No, you've got to look at all those four things at once. They're not right there, right in front of you. One's over to the left, one's to the right, one's on the other side of the room. And you've got to be able to see them all at once. And some people can do it and some people can't. But initially it's very hard and once you've had a bit of practice, most people get the idea. Some people, I think, never manage it and they're always going wrong and fluffing about. But you can, in fact, train your eyes to see sideways. And so some people have good rope sides, other people struggle through it. Other people, I think, pretend they've got it and don't really have it at all. So that's what rope sight is, seeing all the ropes at once. Now we're going to do a try some Bob Minor, plain Bob Minor, and you're going to be on the second. I'll mm -hmm. count one to six, and then off we'll go. Now, what's your first dodge? Uh, three, four down. Three, four down, that's right. You know the, the, the pattern after that. Okay, I might put some bobs in. Mm -hmm. uh, try and catch you out. Okie doke. Right, off we go. Rounds on six. One, two, three, four, five, 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 six. What I do is I count. When I get them to try and ring their bell, they're the only one in the tower. Without looking at anybody or any other ropes, start off See, can they? Well, of course they can't to start with, but the more they do it, the better they get at it. Go playing ball four, five, six. One, two, three, 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 four, five, six. One, two, and that's an exercise they can do on their own and be quite good at it before they've met any other ringers. When they do meet the other ringers, they've got the bell control to be quite good. And that doesn't bore the other ringers silly with some learner who can't even control the bell properly. Six, one, two, three, four. What are you doing? Uh, five, six, up. You did it in three, four. You did it in three, four. <laughs> The ringers at Addington practice once a week on a Monday from 8 to half past 9 in the evening. Led by Tower Captain Eric Godfrey, the more advanced ringers practice ringing methods while the learning members of the band get used to the handling of the bell. It's fun activity. It's, uh also part of one's Christian worship. We feel that we're, we're part of the, the church. We are contributing, we're calling people to church, but we enjoy what we're doing and uh, we enjoy being together. combination of physical activity and mental activity and so you can't just come along on uh, say a Monday night and, and practice for an hour you've got to go away and read a book think about it learn your methods as we say so you can't, can't just think oh, it's going to be one hour a week it, it takes over a bit of your time rather like learning a musical instrument you've got to practice a bit long more than that and in order to improve, then you, you perhaps have to go out and ring at other churches and ring with other people. I mean, if your church has got six bells and you want to learn eight bell ringing, you've got to go somewhere else to do it. So it's a way of learning, progressing, improving, as well as providing a service for the church and the community. The ringers call people to worship. They remind the whole community, or at least as much of the community as can hear them, that church service is about to happen. Some of the ringers have to go off 
from ringing on a Sunday morning to ring at other churches and perhaps they go and worship in their own parishes. But we're not in a situation where people just come and ring and then don't go to church themselves. And I think that's very important. The ringers are, are very much committed members of the congregation and relate very well with me personally um, in terms of, of telling me when they're going to do specific things. Um, and it's a very good relationship. It's our autumn outing. You like to get out and about. I think when we go out, it gives us a chance to develop our skills and other bells, bigger bells, short, smaller bells, and so on. And we come back all the better for it. And we've enjoyed day out in the, in the countryside, met local people, run at places we haven't been to before. Uh, and it's a real treat of a day out. We're going to five towers and uh, three of them in the morning. The third tower is Basildon and the, the, the interesting thing about Basildon is it's a, it's a glass tower built for the millennium so it's not like a normal church tower. You can actually see the ringers and the bells from outside in the street. So we'll be watched by the public. <laughs> since it's in, yes, it's, since it's in a, a shopping area we might have uh, an audience so we've got to read jolly well then. <laughs> Your first place, Ben, you do six, five, six, four sleeves wrong, thirds, dodge the treble, fourths, and up to the go up to the back to be this back. And you run straight into the front, then. Right. Your sixth so, place, right. Bell, you do fourths. Look in the book. Look in the book. Those didn't ring last time, ring. Really. And a few who didn't, who rang last time, please ring some rounds. Ringing in cathedrals is a slightly higher level of the art, mainly because of the number of bells and quite often the difficulty of handling. At Exeter Cathedral there is an open practice once a month where ringers from all over the country can improve their skills on the second heaviest ring of 12. We have a practice once a month on a Saturday, as you can see, and the idea is that we enable anybody who wants to come and ring can come and ring here. Being a cathedral and being especially heavy bells, it's not always appropriate for people to come and ring any time for services and things. But the Saturday we allow anyone to come, and everybody, every ringer who comes will be given a ring. I know ringers throughout the country. Um, I've got friends who've come down from Reading today, you know, and they've come ringing, and we go for a meal and a, you know, go for curry afterwards. And I and I really I really love that side that side to ringing. If you go to a, a strange tower, um, they ask the question, "Are you a ringer?" And as soon as you say yes, you've got a, 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 a bunch of friends, and I love that. I really do.
My family and I have um, come to Exeter on a university open day with my daughter and uh, we are bell ringers. So uh, we're meeting up with friends whom we know who are bell ringers here in Exeter as well. From a bell ringer's point of view, the massive Cathedral of Christ at Liverpool is one of the most important, housing the heaviest set of bells in the world hung for change ringing. A set of 12 bells which we ring on a regular basis um, with the, the treble weighing about nine and a half hundredweight not quite half a ton going all the way through to the tenor bell weighing 82 hundredweight just over four tons uh, we've also got a sharp second which uh, we can use instead of the other two which provides us with a light eight uh, with a tenor of about 24 hundredweight uh, so we can uh, have a choice uh, whether we want to ring on a light eight or, or the back eight occasionally sometimes um, and we also have, uh, as a boarding bell, we have Great George, uh, which is 14 and 3 quarter tons, which is only ever rung on very special occasions. Yeah, we are all needed because I want to ring uh, two on the tenor again. In terms of the um, installation, one or one or two other added features, of course, is the way that it's set up here in the ringing chamber. It's very much at the moment, and has been for quite some time, got a building site aspect to it with the black beams. Uh, the beams that, that are here in the, in the ringing chamber support everything inside the tower um, further up, including the two floors and the, the bells in the frame. So they, they have to be quite substantial. As well as the beams inside the ringing chamber here, we've got the ring, as it's sometimes known. Um, it's a little bit unclear exactly why it is like that, other than the fact that certainly for the heavier bells, you, you don't want the rope falling all around your feet. But even so, there are boxes around the, around the back of the tenor bells anyway. Um, it's not quite so clear as to say why the ring's there for the front bells quite so much. And of course, because we're rather prone to inclement weather up here and the water ingress, what we also have as a, as a means of absorbing the water is the rather unusual aspect of sawdust in the, on the floor instead of a carpet. <laughs> but um, it does need changing from time to time. <laughs> In terms of the setup of the installation, it's again one of a unique feature of having a concrete frame 
uh, which is uh, hung radially, so that the forces on and the bells all, all go through the middle of the tower, uh, which adds some stability to the tower itself. And as a result, um, I don't think the tower moves, although I suspect it must do to some extent. Because the bells are hung radially, um, there is no draw on the rope at all. So uh, when the rope falls off the wheel, it's on a direct line straight above your head when you're ringing. Um, and with no frame movement at all, the bells actually go for the weight exceptionally well. In terms of having a, a really heavy set of bells, um, I, I suppose there is some sort of sense of achievement of being able to place something weighing four tons um, precisely uh, to strike exactly when you want it to um, and, and to, to have a feeling of um, some power over the bell at that point. In the early years of ringing, uh, in the 17th century, uh, groups of men came together uh, to ring uh, under a banner and perhaps to try and ring things for the very first time. So we had the London Scholars uh, ringing in London, the Eastern Scholars based in Norwich, uh, ringing some of the very early peals. Uh, societies like uh, the Ancient Society of College Youths, as it's now called, were formed to give gentlemen of a particular class the opportunity to meet with like-minded people. At St Paul's Cathedral, the bells are hung in the northwest tower, the one on the left. The college youths practice here and at a rotor of other towers every Tuesday night from 8 o'clock. The practice lasts one and a half hours, to which all members are welcome. The ringing spans a variety of methods usually more advanced methods from Stedman Sinks through to Surprise Maximus, sometimes spliced, and the college youths aspire, although we don't always achieve it, to a very high standard of striking as well. They're a majestic ring of bells. They're not, by the standards, very hard to ring, but the whole atmosphere of the place means that uh, you're always on edge when you're ringing there. There are some people who see the college youth as a bit of an elite, and perhaps as distant from ordinary ringers. I'd like to think that isn't the case. The vast majority of college youths do ring at their local towers on Sundays as well. It's just that membership of a society such as that is an extra dimension. For me it's an extension of ringing itself, you know, it's all the things that 
that most people I think ring for. It's to challenge yourself and, and test yourself and, and enjoy getting good ringing and socialising. The relationship between the college youths and the Cumberlands I would describe as symbiotic. I think both societies need the other to be strong so that the competition and the rivalry is maintained. It's always good when we do get together, when we have an excuse to do that. Either we've done things like have sort of striking competitions or um, just happens if we're sort of ringing peels in the same part of the world, we'll end up in the pub together or um, those sort of things. And, and, and some college come and ring here on Sundays and some of us go and ring at St Paul's occasionally and things. So they're, I think they're, there's a rivalry, but it's friendly. Founded in 1891, the Central Council of Church Bell Ringers is the representative body of the exercise. The weekly publication of the Council is The Ringing World, through which people can keep up to date with news of the bell ringing community. Its role is still advisory. Uh, it doesn't have any mandatory powers. It does collect all the appeals and recognise the appeals that are rung, provided they meet with the decisions that the council has adopted over the years. It responds to a variety of things that happen over the years um, and gives advice on all sorts of aspects nowadays, bell restoration, setting up ringing centres, helping and advising on educational matters and producing a whole range of publications which can be bought at very reasonable cost these days um, for benefiting learners and um, new ringers coming into the exercise. There is always the problem, same with all church work, is that there is an ageing population. When I learnt to ring, most of the people who learnt to ring were youngsters. You learnt when you went to school, or if you'd been in the choir, and you went and learnt to ring in the belfry. Whereas these days, you'll find that most of the recruits are, tend to be older. Perhaps they've had children settle down, and then perhaps find they've got more time, a little bit freer, and take up ringing. So one of the biggest problems that I envisage in the future is the leaders of the exercise. I think it'll spread. It's such a marvellous hobby, occupation, musical entertainment, whatever you like to call it. It's marvellous. It's marvellous. It is a, an important part, in my view, of church life and, and the importance of ringing for services cannot be overemphasised. Um, if bell ringing didn't uh, take place for that purpose, then I'm not sure that I would be particularly interested. I think one of the main things about it is that it doesn't matter whether you're a High Court judge or the dustman, or whether you're nine years old or 89, everybody gets in together and you know, you're judged to some extent by your ability on the end of a rope, but basically um, you're just other people, which you know, I, th I think is the way life should be. It sounds sad to say, but it really is my life. I met my wife Wendy at ringing, and uh, we ring together. And often we're out three or four evenings a week, usually ringing, um, and functions on Saturdays and Sundays. So we do a lot of ringing. I teach new people as well, so it means an enormous amount to me. Um, I mean, I've been ringing for 37 years or something like that, um, and I'm trying to imagine my life without ringing, and I do find it difficult. It would be a very, very big hole, um, and it's 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 much to do with the, yes, with the, the enjoyment of the whole experience. Thank you.